loved ones died Surely someone will reach out a hand And show you a safe place to land Be the hand of a hopeful stranger A little scared but you're strong enough Be the light in the dark of this day hand of a hopeful stranger a little scared but you're strong enough be the light in the dark of this danger till the sun comes up be the hand of a hopeful stranger a little scared but you're strong enough be Please stand if you're able for the call to worship. We have entered this place in confident expectation. Let us be open to one who greets us here. This is a special place of meeting and inspiration. We are glad for one another in God's awesome presence. Let us praise our God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Glory and honor to the one whose spirits we receive. Let's pray. Breathe in this place, O Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit to open our minds, unlock our heart, and aliven our faith so that we may welcome the risen one among us. Amen.
Let us pray. God of all who doubt and believe, by the gift of your spirit, enable us to hear with our ears, to see with our eyes, and to touch with our hands your word of life. Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God, amen. Scripture reading is taken from Psalms 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kinded live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Sion. For there the Lord ordained his blessings life forevermore. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The gospel lesson for today is taken from the gospel according to St. John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. The Gospel according to St. John, chapter 20, verses 19 from 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear for the Jews, fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nail and my hands in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God.
A greetings to you all. I am greatly humbled to stand before you and share the good news. God is so amazing. I never thought a day like this would come in my life. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for our worship today and for the message we are about to hear. May the words bring you glory. We pray that we will hear the good news of this message with open hearts and live lives that glorify you more and more each day. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. It was in the morning in 1979 when we received the news from the headmen that the freedom fighters were, came, were coming to camp at our homestead that night. My uncle and my auntie, whom I lived with, received the news with a mixture of anxiety, excitement, and disappointment. Hosting the freedom fighters was against the government law. This was also risk because if there was going to be an ambush, my aunt and my uncle were old and they would not be able to run for their lives. There was no option to refuse the request. The liberation struggle, which started in 1964 in Zimbabwe and ended in 1979, was between the African fighters, known as the freedom fighters, and the white minority government led by Ian Smith. During the war, the freedom fighters used the night vigils, Pungwe, as a cultural and political space to educate the masses through speeches, dance, known as Kongonya, and other artistic expressions about justice and the necessity of the Chimurenga liberation struggle against oppression. My cousin and I were so excited because we were going to eat nice food that was going to be prepared for the freedom fighters by the villagers. As young toddlers, it was going to be our first time to see the freedom fighters face to face. After supper that night, we heard footsteps outside the kitchen. We went outside to investigate and saw heavily armed young men and women carrying their guns, AK-47, bazookas, grenades, and other weapons we have heard other children talking about at school. The meeting was done and the freedom fighters and villagers left before dawn. On that night, we did not go to sleep. We did not go to sleep because my aunt and my uncle were scared for they knew that housing the freedom fighters could invite problems with the government soldiers that could cost our lives. We sat in the kitchen frightened. After sunrise, my little cousin went outside to fetch firewood. He came back running saying that the soldiers were coming towards our homestead. My uncle rushed to close the door and locked the door. The soldiers arrived and ordered us to come out. They said they knew we were hiding in the kitchen. We came out shaking with fear. We were asked 
why we were hiding. My uncle replied, we were not hiding, but we were sleeping. You must tell the truth, one soldier shouted, and guilt was written all over our faces. Although showing solidarity with freedom fighters could have been a good thing, this was against the law. We all knew that. Amongst the soldiers, I noticed a priest whom I knew. Apparently, the priest was an army chaplain who was at this moment being deployed to the war front. I screamed, priest, papa. He looked at me and moved towards and knelt before me. He said he was touched by the excitement that I showed when I shouted. He asked if I was baptized. I said yes in the Anglican church. We felt peace in our hearts. In retrospect, I don't even know what made me scream, but I believe that God had sent the Holy Spirit to fill the priest who disrupted this situation that could have been catastrophe. I learned that always, uh, I learned that God always intervenes in situations that are beyond our control. It is after the arrival of the Emmaus couple and the two Marys who reported that they had seen the Lord. The great news did not stop the disciples from hiding in the upper room. The gospel. John's present to us the frightened disciples locking themselves behind closed door for fear of the Jewish leaders who had brutally murdered their master. They are afraid of the angry mob and the Jewish leaders that they may come after them. And hiding in the upper room was the safest thing to do because their world had been turned upside down in a matter of days. We cannot blame them for hiding because what seemed unshakable was suddenly doubtful. Just imagine the swell of emotions going through their minds, the sadness, the confusion, and the guilt of deserting Jesus in the hour of need. The episode of Jesus' death was overwhelming. I'm trying to imagine if this had happened in this modern day with technology. What could be the headlines in different social media platforms? Maybe the Facebook, in the Facebook, there was going to be the post of Jesus from his trial up to his death with the, red, with the headline, reactions to the killing of the alleged Messiah, false king of the Jews. YouTube could have shown the whole drama from the trial to crucifixion. And Twitter could have tweeted, just in, the Jews tweets the crucifixion of notorious Jesus. Probably this was going to be the most trending topic on social media platforms. Confused and frightened disciples sought shelter where they thought was safe and would be protected from the chaos that was going on. And locking themselves in closed door indicates that they had not credited Mary's reports that Jesus had risen after their visits to the tomb, according to the Gospel of Luke 1, verse 25. In response to their fear, Jesus presented himself and said, Peace be with you. 
The gift of peace to the disciples is a reminder that needed to is a reminder that they needed to face the Jewish authority with the anointing of peace from Jesus. Jesus could have realized that the disciples might, might think he is a ghost and he showed them the hands and the sides. Repeating of peace be with you is not repetitive, but a direct echo of his prayer and was meant to settle and calm all the emotions that were raging inside the disciples. The, the reason Jesus penetrated the security system of the disciples and liberated them from their fear that distracted them from life, from life in all its fullness, forgiving them for their betrayal, and also encouraging them to forgive others. Jesus fulfilled the promise he made in John 14, verse 16 to 17, that he will send the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. The breath of the risen Jesus Christ made the timorous disciples into new men. Jesus did not join the, 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 the disciples to celebrate his resurrection, but to give them the Holy Spirit and send them into the world to continue his mission. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, and so I will send you. Thomas did not believe the disciples when they told him that they encountered Jesus. He wanted to see for himself. His name tells us in Aramaic, he is a twin. But there is no way in the Bible where it is written that he was a twin. The name also means fame and fortune. Thomas is famous for doubting the resurrection of his master. For unmentioned reasons, Thomas was not with the, the disciples when Jesus appeared to them. Imagine, whilst others are hiding as a group, Thomas is out there in an unknown place. Thomas demanded basic evidence for their claim. Unfortunately, by this demand, Thomas ends himself a label, a doubter. John focused on Thomas as the only doubting disciple. Yes, he is a doubter as a lady, but also, other disciples demonstrated their doubt about Jesus' resurrection by hiding, despite Jesus repeatedly telling them that about his death, being rejected, and his resurrection. No one can blame Thomas or the disciples because Jesus had defied human expectations. In their life experience, the disciples knew that if a person dies and be buried, that person cannot rise again. Thomas' character is depicted in the book of John as a more skeptic than a loyal but pessimistic follower of Jesus. He was a modern man finding faith. Jesus appears to Thomas and shows him proof of his identity. Thomas, Thomas' demands set the stage for Jesus' appearance in these verses. The description of the gathering and Jesus showing up in verse 26 matches verse 19. 
a week after the same disciples who saw the risen Jesus did not go into the streets with his shouts of joy that he is risen. They went back again into the upper room and locked the door again. Can you imagine how frightened these people were? Jesus shows up again and offers to give Thomas exactly what he demanded. He is not upset. He grants them the peace, peace again and tells to Thomas, who once famously said, I will not believe until I see the marks of the nails. He asked Thomas to put his fingers into the wounds. Jesus meets the conditions that Thomas set for his belief and offer himself as a motivation for Thomas to move from unbelief to belief. And this led to the confession of Jesus as the Lord and God. It is not the touching that leads Thomas to confession of faith, but Jesus' gracious offer of himself. In this instance, Jesus is not shaming Thomas, but giving Thomas what he needs. In real life, people will need evidence to believe. We need proof. We cannot blame Thomas here. He is acting normal. Jesus does not disparage the faith of the disciples which was grounded in sight. Some people treat Some people treat Thomas' skepticism as a weakness, but it is important to remember that Jesus welcomed skepticism and challenged his doubt with evidence of his resurrection. Although the apostle Thomas is a famous symbol of doubt, we have a great lesson here. Our doubts lead us to a deeper, richer faith. Jesus said that, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. But Jesus does not also ask all of us to blindly put our faith in him, but to investigate the truth of the resurrection. The disciples witnessed Jesus performing other signs, proving that he is the Messiah. The scripture asserts that Jesus performed many miracles that could not be included. But what that was included, and, uh, uh, that, but the contrast between are not written and these are written underscores for people who live after the first generation that the words of the gospel text will lead to faith in Jesus and through the faith to the new life. The text brings the Christological to the reader to have faith in the identity of Jesus as the Son of God, and a soteriological to offer the reader the new life and the experience of new life that is available because the work of Jesus has been completed. Today's scripture suggests that an engagement with the biblical text with its offer and its interpretation of God is vital to the life of faith. Jesus' gospel is primarily directed to the edification of us Christians. 
This scripture ended with a beatitude on those who have not seen but have believed. I would like to think most of us are living in some form of fear. Many have been hurt in various ways, be it in friendship, family relations, or love. And many are afraid to engage themselves in other relationships for fear of being disappointed again. Sometimes we are afraid of making decisions either at work or at college because we are afraid of making wrong decisions that will make us regret later. Some are afraid that their career paths may not bring the much desired satisfaction that they, what they are searching for. Some people try to avoid disappointment. Disappointing their bosses or supervisors because they are afraid of the consequences that may arise from their actions. As the students, we are afraid to disappoint our lecturers, our friends, or our families because we are afraid of what we might face after our action. We are living in the society that is full of racism, sexism, and men are engulfed in, by fear that we may fall victims of segregation. As we approach the end of the semester, some of us are afraid that we may fail to attain a good GPA and thereby jeopardizing our chances of pursuing PhD studies at good institutions. Some, especially the international students, are anxious about the many visa process that await them after graduation before they can be employed in the United States of America. Others are afraid to go back to their countries because they are afraid of the poverty, the political violence in their countries. We are locking ourselves in our own upper rooms of fear. The Gospel of John is reminding us that we are not alone in our chain of, in our chain of faithful. Our Lord Jesus Christ is entering into our closed space of our fear and, she, and, and ensures us to fear no more. All fear has been conquered by the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus conquered the grave forever so that the Son of Man, whom we save, whom we only transcend, uh, who, who only not transcend our locked doors, but also enter our space of fear and uncertainty and offers us his peace. Today, God is generously granting us peace. When Jesus says, peace be with you, showing us the wounds, he is reminding us that there is no suffering or challenge that we may face that God has not known. The Lord who is our shepherd will guide us through our terrain of fear and lead us to still waters that will quench our anxiety. All we need is to believe in the Son of Man, our Messiah. The scripture calls the Christian community to re-examine its identity as a people shaped by the biblical text. Jesus cannot be stopped by our locked doors. Jesus comes to us as he came to the first disciples during their fear, pain, doubt, and confusion. Christ comes speaking peace, breathing into our anxious life the breath of the Holy Spirit. As Jesus kept coming back to the disciples, our God 
keeps coming back for us, sending us out of our safe locked rooms into the world that need us so desperately. May our fear be replaced with joy as we celebrate Easter season. May our fear be nullified, for it is in this fear God has done the most significant work of all. We need his gifts of life and peace to continue our fearless journey of faith. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you join me in the prayer of intercession? Living God, giver of life, hear us as we pray, saying, pour out your blessing, O Lord. Send us your Holy Spirit of peace. We pray for the church. Let your church be a living sign of the woundedness and the healing of Christ, sharing the gift of forgiveness and the gospel of reconciliation. Pour out your blessing, O oh Lord. We pray for the earth. Help us to see the scars of death that mark your good creation and to seek the blessing of life that you offer to all creatures. Pour out your blessing, O oh Lord. We pray for all nations. Show us how good and pleasant it is when people live together in unity and anoint us with your wisdom, so that we may seek the ways of life. Pour out your blessing, O oh Lord. We pray for this community. Give us a vision of the common good, not clinging to our own possessions, but seeking to the fullness of life for all as a testimony to Christ's resurrection. Pour out your blessing, O oh Lord. We pray for loved ones. Be near to those who walk in despair and lead us all into Christ's light so that our fellowship may be true and our joy may be complete. Pour out your blessing, O oh Lord. Yes. Together, by the blessing of your spirit, help us to live as we pray so that the world may come to know the gift of life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ invites to this table all who love him, who intend to lead a life worthy of his name and who seek to love themselves and their neighbors. Christ prays for us. So also our ancestors who have gone before us. As we come to this table, may we be refreshed to work for peace on earth and justice and righteousness for all of humanity. Let us work for honor and dignity for the poor and the oppressed until Christ's coming again. Let us pray. God of all glory, beauty, and grace, we have tried to hide from you 
to hide our faces, to hide our sin. Yet you have never hidden your love for us. We have tried to search for you in temples, in clouds, on mountaintops. Yet you have already revealed yourself to us in the face of Jesus Christ. Forgive us and transform us so that our lives may shine with your glory, beauty, and grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us offer one another signs of reconciliation and love. Mm-hmm. Can you stand right here? Let us pray. Lift your drooping hands and weak knees and raise up your faint hearts and little ones. Lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God who gathers us together. To the one who welcomes us to the table, we give thanks and praise. Let us give thanks to God. Creator God, we give you thanks in all times and places. We give thanks for your people created in your image. We give thanks for your people and pray for those who have been challenged by oppressive forces beyond human understanding. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the unshakable example of what it means to be fully human and fully holy. You showed us that to be your people means to live in peace, work in harmony, strive for justice, and worship in truth. You showed us that you are never, never satisfied as long as one of your children is without dignity, honor, or freedom. No one is free unless everyone is free. Therefore, because we are children of a loving God, we lift our eyes to heaven and praise the God who made us like the colors of the rainbow and sing. is your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send empty away. 
Your own son came among us to serve, to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. Yes, baby. That's a microphone. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new covenant by water and spirit. On the night of his great trial and betrayal, Jesus took bread and gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and shared it with his friends, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. It's given for you. Do this always remembering me. Most will serve the best drink first, but the Lord saves the best for last. Jesus took the cup after supper supper and gave thanks to God, and he shared it with his friends, saying, Drink, drink from this cup, all of you. This is a new covenant poured out for each of you and for the forgiveness of sins of all. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the great mystery of faith. on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them for, be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. I will wash your hands in just a second. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Eat from the bread we have broken and share in the unity of the body. Drink from the cup of blessing, share his death and his life. Come, let us be served joyfully. of God, let us pray the Lord's Prayer in the language of your choosing. Our Creator, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I don't think I can hold you and break the bread. Come, the table is for all. Come.
She's saying, hmm. Let's pray the prayer of thanksgiving together. God, your bread and your cup renew us, spirits. No matter the times we have failed to show up to your call or to our own needs or to the cries of our neighbors, you have received us again. May the unending grace be our foundation as we journey with Christ. Amen.
Sí.